Todd. So good to have you with us in the house of God this morning. You know, I want to tell you a little secret. That us preachers, evangelist ministers in our training, our schooling, we sat for a number of years in the classroom. I remember back then when that was my life. And we yearn to graduate and go into our churches because we have this notion, this idea, this belief that it's good preaching And that grows churches, and we want so much to be a part of the growth of the church. But I've talked to preachers, I happen to be one, and we have come, a number of us, to understand that, yes, preaching grows. It is by God to grow the church, but, but no, we have come to understand, no, it's not a sales pitch. Great praise grows churches. I'm telling you the truth. I've learned that. You can measure what's happening in a church, in the lives of its people, in the growth of its numbers. You can measure it by the level of the folks' praise. And praise glorifies God, and when God is glorified, good things happen in the church. Don't you know that we don't take preaching into heaven, but we'll take praise into heaven. And God tells us preachers, don't you forget that. We need praise, and I'm so thankful that our song leaders, they are, are devoted, determined, consecrated, all of that to help us be a church with a high level of praise. Keep it up, men. Keep it up. I'm a fan. Christian and Ricardo, you know, I, I want to say to you that I was thinking about the optics sitting there and I've sat in churches in which I preached and been blessed to be there and one of the great optics is these bookends as far as brethren are concerned because we lead out into public worship in specific ways not holistic ways everybody Everybody leads out in worship and prayer and praise and all of that. But I've been very thankful to God that no church excluded have these bookends. These older, seasoned, solid men who have been with God for a while in that church for a while and they come to the pulpit and they do what God has asked them to do, what the brethren expect them to do under the leadership. And then there are those Christians, and because it was those younger men who come, and that lets you know that God knows how to validate his work by those men who have been doing it in the past and present and those men who are going to be doing it well out in the future, and that's to the glory of God. So I'm thankful to see those young men. A great optic. I want to speak this morning on this second lesson, second sermon, 
about spiritual wisdom. That's what we're talking about. I clarify spiritual wisdom because we're not of the mindset that all wisdom is spiritual. It's wisdom, but it may not be spiritual wisdom. But we're talking specifically about what all of God's people need to have, non excluded men and women, young and old, titled folks, and those who do not have titles. Is spiritual wisdom. And we are talking this morning on the second. There's so many, but the second facet of spiritual wisdom that we want to focus on is relationships. We talked about releasing now relationships, making sure, making sure that the bad people bad people, people of not good intentions, not good character, not good motives, not even sent by God, permitted by God, but not sent by God. Bad folks are no longer empowered. Let's stand together and read the word, James 1, 5. Thank you for the standing of the word. Referencing God, giving God the reverence for the word. If, <laughs> if any of you lacks wisdom, that's what James says, let him ask of God who gives to all liberally and without reproach. And it will be given to him. Let's pray together, God. Lord God, help us speak into our hearts, our minds, our spirits. We need a word from you this morning. God, we did our, our own private study this uh, week, and we shared with you in moments of the reading of the word. But God, Lord's Day morning, we need a fresh wind and a fresh fire of your word. We need a revelation. We need a clarity through the proclamation and the preaching of the word, which is an act of worship. So, Father, speak. Speak in us, through us. Speak to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Last week we spoke about releasing, making sure that the past remains the past. I think that is a first step into the wisdom of a going forward life is what you are willing to let God to allow you to leave behind. Let go. Relinquish it. it. has no place in where God wants to take you. It's a part of you that somehow may see this need to bring it forward, but God says, no, I, I don't really need that. Whatever it is. Let it alone. Let it go. We spoke about that. The second is relationships, making sure that bad people are no longer empowered. And then next Lord's Day week, if the Lord doesn't return, and that'll be okay too, right? In fact, that'll be better. Really, better, best. We want to speak about responsibilities, making sure that we're faithful in our duties and our obligations. 
making sure that bad people are no longer in power. I want to say a word about James 1.5, but let me just ask you to think about this. God doesn't shut down the possibility of bad people coming into the space of your life. Doesn't always shut it down. Prevent it. Stop it. Keep it from happening. But know this. God never empowers bad actors that he permits. We do that. That's, that's what we do. What God allows doesn't mean it's what God authorizes. Oh, get that in your spirit. That some people have been allowed, but they are not authorized by God. At least God Almighty, small g God, yes, but not Almighty God. So I've got to understand that they may be here in my space, but they don't have to be here in my faith. And I want to make that distinction so that, so that there are two things that I get out of the James text. That we are at the highest, highest, highest point of right thinking. I, I, I believe this. This is not a, a knee-jerk statement. No, I think we are at the the pinnacle, the, the apex of, of right thinking when we admit that we need wisdom. You're never thinking more right than when you say, I need to be wise. Can you imagine a teenager coming to you as a parent and say, you know what, I need us to be wise. You were whoa. <laughs> Man, you say, whoa, that's better than that A in geometry, but keep making the A. You know that as an engineer. <laughs> need to be wise. Your husband comes to a wife and says, honey, if there's anything I need is wisdom. You say, amen to that. And vice versa. When the brother or sister tells you that I'm going through something, I'm dealing with something. In fact, God has blessed me with something. God has taking something, but what I need is to be wise. You know that that person is in their spiritual A game of their thinking so that we must commit ourselves to pray for it. That's right thinking. All the time. The longer you live, you know what you know. But you also know what you need to know that you don't fully know. And you need wisdom. You know you're in some stuff. You know you're dealing with some stuff that doesn't just require textbook learning, but the application of knowledge. How do you bring it together? How do you pull it together? How do you, how do you make what I know make sense in the daily grind of life? How do you, how do, you do that? That's wisdom. It's when I start walking it out, talking it out, living it out. So when we pray for wisdom, this is what James 1.5 teaches me. Don't be surprised. Get this in your spirit. I know this is of God. I'm not even wise enough to come up with this. This is of God. Don't be surprised if God's first move is to bring our foolishness out where it's very clear and visible for us to see and even for others to see and point out. I think sometimes when we are praying for wisdom, we think we're, we're praying for, for him to do things, let's call it, in the positive side. 
But sometimes God says, no, I got to deal with the stinking thinking before I can get you into right thinking. Got to help you to see how, 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 bang, bang, how, how foolish you are in your choices. I'll get down to the infusion of wisdom, but let's keep it in foolishness for a while. So, you know what happens? When I'm seeking wisdom, all of a sudden I get this burst of, man, that sure was foolish what I did. That sure was foolish what I said. That sure was foolish. What God is doing is teaching me first what doesn't work, will not work, cannot work for you. Foolishness is not going to work for the child of God. It may work in the world, but not for the child of God. God is not going to make it work, allow it to work. So here it is. Four things that just size up what we want to speak about, about spiritual wisdom and bad relationships. First of all, bad relationships will undermine our relationship with God. Sooner or later, it's going to happen. Just mark that down. Share that with your young people. Share that with your brother and sister. Share that with somebody who needs to know that, that bad relationships will undermine our relationship with God. It's going to happen sooner or later. You're going to see it. We cannot compartmentalize it, segregate it over here, put it over here where it doesn't impact us over here. Secondly, looking back or seeing it in real time, Sometimes I look back and, and I say, yeah, that's true. Sometimes I see it in real time that bad relationships will rank one or two on the list of our most serious, hurtful, and painful mistakes that we regret. You mark that down. That's true. Some of the greatest pains and aches and anxieties and agonies, we call it mess, that will unfold in your life. Deal with people. People. Bad actors. Wrong folks. And that will time and time again be what most people come to you to talk about and pray about. A problem I have is normally a people problem. Lawnmowers that can be fixed or given to your neighbor. My mother used to tell me the story about the lady that baked a bad cake, and she said, it don't taste good at all. I know what I do. I'll take it to the potluck. You know, people bring. <laughs> there are times when we want to dish something to the church. <laughs> well, you can do something with that, but bad folks, wrong people, you'll begin to notice, man, that's my problem here. That's my issue. That's what keeps me up at night. Takes me down on my knees. Makes me tear up. Bad folks. So we need wisdom. The third thing is that a cycle, oh, somebody needs to hear me, a cycle of bad relationships can become habit forming. I've seen it. I've, I've seen it. Without the wisdom that confronts what's gone wrong in our self-identity. Now, can I say this to you and me? When I, not all the time, but many times when I hook up with wrong people, it's because something has gone wrong in my self-identity. How I see myself, how I value myself, how I assess myself. Not always. But you know as well as I, that sometimes, not always, when people come to you, especially in the dating and the friendships, and they spend uh, your, your time and their time talking about 
this bad person in their life, after about 20 minutes, you may not say it, but you're thinking about them, not the person that they're talking about. Oh, you didn't catch that, did you? I don't mean that to be cruel and judgmental, but but it it reveals me who I connect with. Says something about me. So that we understand that sometimes the problem is with me, not this bad actor. And then number four, bad relationships will often introduce some level. Now this is important for you to get. It will introduce some level of stress, strain, and tension in the good relationships that we have. Now I've seen that. Breaks mother's hearts. Breaks dad's heart. Breaks parents' hearts. And you're having to deal with the minutia of a fallout in their bad relationship. And sometimes it begins to affect even the good relationship that you have with them. Because you have to, you have to say some things. You have to uh, 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 deal with some things. And, and maybe they're not even ready to hear it. And, and it begins to even uh, bleed over into this good relationship. So we need wisdom. This is the whole thing in a nutshell. So let's talk about it. Now, when you look at the Old Testament, one of the dominant principles that God established with his people, not always with the pagan world, is cutting out and cutting out bad people. Cutting out and cutting off bad people. You can teach this, some of you, because you understand it. Most Christians who have some elementary view of the Bible know how God began to tell his people, you, you are my people, so watch out for those folks. Under God's call and new direction, get this now, get this now, pay attention to God's command to Abram now the Lord, this is the first thing he said, not down in the list. This is the first thing he said, speaking to Abram. Get out of your country from your family and from your father's house. First thing he said is, you've got to cut some people out and off. That's what God said. So here it is, moving from the wrong people is a first move. Not some move down the road that God cannot, best of you, cannot wait till later. Can't, we can't deal with this later. We can deal with certain things later, but you've got to deal with this first. To go forward with me, he, she, him, got to go. That's what God says. We move from wrong people by God's command. It's not just about what we get to decide for ourselves. God made the choice. Abram, they got to go. He said, you think about it. Tell me what you think. I probably will agree with you. Now God says, no, let me tell you right up in front that you've got to let go. Now, let's go deeper. That's what he said to Abram. That's what he said from the beginning. That, 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 you see them folks right there? They're, they're not a part of your future. They're not a part of your blessing. They're not a part of the guidance of God. If you keep them in your life, they show not going to be a part of your prayer list. But they should have been let go. Seeking the wrong things for the wrong reason, this is a principle in the Old Testament, can blind us to wrong people. Let's just read the text. And Lot lifted up his eyes and saw all the plain of Jordan that it was well watered everywhere before the Lord. Now he slides in an ominous word. Two cities. We only know it now because we know the story. Sodom and Gomorrah. That's their first introduction into the scripture in the context of Abram, of Lot's life. 
like the garden of the Lord. Then Lot chose for, see, it's not your choice, Abraham, but watch Lot to know it's my choice. He chose for himself all the plain of the Jordan. That's not bad, but keep reading. Lot dwelt in the cities of the plain and pitched his tent even as far as Sodom. That's not bad, but keep reading. He says, here it is. But the men of Sodom were exceedingly wicked and sinful against the Lord. Notice, as far as, he went too far. And he lost a lot. His son-in-law, his wife, he lost it, man. Because he didn't understand that, that when you got your mind set on the wrong things, you got to talk to somebody who's dating. You got to talk to somebody who's, who's trying to uh, win the approval of people, who's trying to establish friendships, who, who still is, is impacted by popularity and approval of people. You've got to tell them, just be careful what your motives are. What it is that you're after here? Be honest about it. Be truthful about it. But, but, but actually, uh, I mean, come on, I've got to get on. But I don't even know why Lot is even with Abraham. He didn't call you. You hooked up. And I think you were blessed. But when you separated from the right person, you opened the gates to the wrong folks. Some people are so wrong, so potentially destructive to what God has in mind for our life that God himself will take action. Notice what he says. Then the Lord said to Moses, depart and go from here. You and the people from whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt to the land of which I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He goes to all these Amorites, Gerbersites, Hittites, Canaanites, all these. He says, listen, listen, listen. I will send my angel before you and I will drive them. I'm not even going to let you. I'll deal with it. Oh, and I'm going to tell you something. So I'm going to tell you something. When God shuts some folks off, don't you bring them back. Don't you send them an RSVP. You know, God says, what, what's up with that? They're gone. They're out. They're, they're done. And you're still trying to negotiate. God says, I'm not in that. I moved. I shut down. I shut them off. They were not going to like you because I don't like them. I love them, but I don't like them for you. Who am I talking to this morning? Any resistance or outright rejection of the wisdom or the warnings of bad relationships will lead to bad outcome. Now, now, judges, let me just jump right into this. I led you from Egypt and brought you to the land of which I swore to your fathers, Judges 2, Judges 2, 1 through, and you shall make no covenant with the inhabitants. Uh, we're talking about covenant. Solemn, sacred agreements covenant is is deep that's that's a that's a pact that's a that's a deep and a, a sense of relationships you don't do that uh you shall tear down their altars but you have not obeyed my voice therefore i will not drive them out and they shall be thorns in your side and their god shall see you 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 wanted them now you got them that's what god says you can't resist it. You can't reject it. When I start telling you who, you remember my idea when people show you who they are, believe them. When God shows you what folks are, believe him. They ain't for you. They never were in his plan. And casting aside the wisdom that has been given about bad relationships can be extremely dangerous. Now, let me just, let me just not go through all this. He had this wisdom, this sagacity. This acumen, and, and he had it, this scholarly approach to life. And God gave, wisest man in the world at that time. I think you can make the case. In this world, only Jesus was wise. And yet, when Solomon was old, his wives turned his heart after other gods. And it says something that's tragic. Solomon did evil. That's Solomon, wise man. 
did evil in the sight of the Lord. So the Lord became angry with him. When you cast aside the wisdom that God has given you about bad relationship, that's extremely dangerous. And the principle is born in the New Testament. Come on. One, two, one, two. Watch out. Watch out now. Be careful. Satanic deception is very very common in bad relationships. They say later on, I just didn't know. I just didn't see. I never had a clue. Because satanic deception is common in bad relationships. When you're in a relationship that's bad, the devil is going to let you see what you want to see, not what you need to see. That's deception. Bad relationships outside of Christ invites conflict. We're just teaching here. Conflict, hostility in our relationship with God. Whoever wants to be a friend of the world, now this is not to be overlooked. Dismiss. And wait a minute, wait a minute, God. Let me let me get this right. Let me let me say. An enemy of God. I don't ever want to be an enemy of God. He said, well, you better let that person go. I don't feel like an enemy ain't what you feel. It's what you are going to do. You're going to start acting like an enemy, not a friend. Some relationships should never have been formed. I'm just quoting the Bible. And if they continue, they will shut down one's relationship with God. God said that should never have been started. Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. What fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? Yoked together. Yoke means that, that I have surrendered my autonomy, my own selfness because I'm yoked. I've got to go where they go. I've got to think like they think. I've got to be what they want me to be. I've got to talk like they talk. I'm yoked now. With unbelievers. And the fellowship has with righteousness and lawlessness. See the incompatibleness of that? Light and darkness. Or oh, what part has a believer with an unbeliever? Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, said the Lord. And then he says, I will receive you and I'll be your father and your son. Meaning that that has been surrendered. Now I go back to being your father. There's a space in which man follows in a worldly relationship. And God says, I can't go with you in that any further. I can't walk with you in that. I can't, I can't, I, I won't. So here it is as we wrap it up. I want to give you a checklist for spiritual wisdom. If we're going to get things right with people, if we're going to get things right with people, spiritual wisdom, friends, acquaintances, associates, family members, dating possibilities, marriage, we have to start seeing things right through fervent prayer. I got to say this. Come on. Come on. Men, Angie, I wish I'd known this when we were young, but it worked out. <laughs> I told you I still got her number, 522-4576. That's her high school number. I mean, I can still just quote that. I tell you how many times I called. I still got that number, man. It's in my head. That, man, that's many years ago. My parents used to say, man, get off the phone. Man, how long can I call back? <laughs> when you talk to folks that you're dating more than you talk to God, that's a problem. When you talk to your friends more than you talk to God, that's a problem. 
God says, you got to get me in there. If we're going to get things right with people, we have to start seeing things right through prayer. Pray about it. Anybody that you are going to hook up in a dating relationship has to be at the top of your prayer list, not somewhere in there. Anybody that you're thinking about marrying has to be at the top of your prayer list. They are the number two person you pray for. The first one is me, God. Help me think right. <laughs> Help me see it right. Help me hold on to my values and convictions. Now I'm them. Secondly, if we're going to make wise decisions about people, it cannot be about what we want, but what God wills. My brother, there's a part in which I got to leave my wants behind so that God's will can take over. Not what you want, but what I will. Not what you want, but what I will, God man. Not what you want. So I've got this ideal woman. Ideal man. Nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that. Anybody that tell you any, uh, that you should not have an ideal because you just ought to think God they allowed that other things as well. No, you ought to have an ideal. But let God keep the ideal real. That, that, that ain't really ideal for you. Not you. That ain't really ideal for you. So here it is. Todd, you come on back because I'm, I'm... The greatest threat to what God is trying to teach us today is to forget what he taught us yesterday about relationships. God says, you've got amnesia, man. You've got too much forgetfulness. You know what? You know what, man? You're having a hard time with Mary but guess what? You had the same problem with Jane and Sue. And you didn't learn anything. You got to know what I taught you. And then finally, this is it. Don't let your learning be more about information but about wiser God-guided decisions. I'm just not gathering information about people. I'm trying to make right decisions about people. I'm not just having a database about people. That alone gets confusing. I'm just trying to be led by God. Who I need to date, who I need to friend with, become a friend. My brother's going to come back. Let me tell you something here. I was developing years ago, and now I have developed that, about family success. I did a weekend seminar in South Carolina about family success. And we talked about family salvation, family strength, you know, some of these things. But you know where it starts with? Is selection. That's where it starts from. You got to select the right folks. You got to make sure that you hooked up. And then it's amazing how Jake, he did. And Isaac got it right, and Esau got it wrong because Esau said, I'll make my own choices about who I connect with. It didn't work out for him. So I want to close with Jesus loves, Jesus understands, Jesus delivers, Jesus saves, Jesus invites, Jesus is coming back. We want you to be saved. We want you to know God up close and personal. We want you to be able to say every night you go to bed that my soul is right with God. That I am in a right place, a safe place. If I wake up, I thank him for his blessing another day. But if he takes me, I know I'll hear him say, welcome home. But you got to be saved. You got to hear, believe, repent, confess, and be baptized. And we can teach you that book, chapter, and verse. Let's stand together and Todd is going to lead us in this invitation.